Uh, chair, the floor is all yours. We apologize for short delay. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Nimesh. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's good evening in India. So wherever you're joining from, uh, welcome. Uh, so this session, as Nimesh said, is on democracy and the global governance. And we have a very short time. It's a one hour session and we have six speakers. So before I just briefly introduce the topic, let me just say uh, or request all speakers to stick to seven minutes such that uh, all of you are able to present your papers. And uh, we also have at least 10 minutes for uh, a little bit of uh, question and answer. Uh, questions will be taken in the chat box and will be sent to me and I'll be posting the question to the speakers. Uh, now, democracy and global governance is such a very uh, relevant topic for the contemporary period. Uh, just 30 years back, if you uh, remember at the end of the Cold War, there was so much optimism uh, about both the international liberal world order and there were scholars like Francis Fukuyama who were talking about uh, uh, liberal democracy winning the ideological uh, uh, debate forever and ever. Uh, but 30 years down the line, we are not so sure. Uh, there is rise of nationalism. Uh, recent events in Afghanistan testify to the return of power politics, uh, rise of China. Uh, so in many ways, both the liberal international order as well as liberal democracy as such uh, has been thrown into a kind of crisis. Uh, and this crisis seems to be what's in it. So it is in this context, uh, we have a collection of papers uh, which discuss some of these issues, uh, uh, starting from nationalism in South Asia, populism, uh, as well as even the current pandemic, which has to be viewed through uh, failure of global governance uh, because of rise of vaccine nationalism uh, and so on. So I look forward to this session uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we will have a productive time uh, I once again request all the speakers to stick to the time limit. I will remind you after six minutes uh, to wind up your paper. Uh, uh, I, I might be a bit rude because we have to keep to the time. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, so we have our first speaker, uh, which is uh, Dr. Kimberly Ann Nasrath from Bombay International School. And her paper is on polarization, populism, and the impact on democracy. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nasrath. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Nice. And thank you, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, for having me here. Okay, so I would just start my paper. Um, so um, when I talk about uh, the world order that we have today and the one that is, um, is, is, is emerging from, from the post, uh, from the COVID pandemic, et cetera, I see two important factors that will play a very important role and that is populism and polarization so basically i'm talking about the domestic politics that would be play that will play a very important role in uh, the 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 framing of the world order that takes place uh, in the future um in the 1980s uh, i mean in the 1980s there was a speaker of the house in the united states that said all politics is local. And in that, in that sense, I feel that talking about ideas like populism and polarization are very apt in the sense that they frame not only the, the, the domestic politics of a state, but they also frame the foreign policy and the way a state behaves in the international community. For instance, neoclassical uh, realists have also talked about the way in which domestic politics play an important role in the way in which states view themselves as well as the way they behave in the international community. So with the rise of populism, now populism has been around for a while, but with the, the rise and the rather the spread of populist movements and populist leaders uh, throughout not only Europe, uh, not only the Asia Pacific, et cetera, but also Europe and America, et cetera, um, the idea of this, the people versus the elite is becoming very much part of policy making. And, and as you know, there are many causes to the rise of populism, uh, the economic uh, disparity and inequality that, that prevails, uh, the negative effects of globalization. Um, in addition to that, uh, the idea of this whole, I, this whole movement of anti-establishment that has been taking place for the last nearly 10, 20 years, um, and it has been building up for a very long time. 
Um, also, it's the failure of traditional politics and traditional parties in, gov in, in states that attest to the fact that there has been a rise of populism and populist leaders, etc., who actually fit into that vacuum created by these, by these, by, by traditional parties, etc. Uh, in addition to that, I would say immigration, um, immigration, and the and the change in demographics is also another really. Um, it, it also has a very major impact on the way in which. Uh, politics works in, in various states. Um, the silent majority, which is no longer silent and has become a very vociferous majority, has in fact had a very major impact on the rise of populist movements uh, and populist leaders, etc. The other reason I would see uh, for the rise in populism is, 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 is the charisma and the charismatic uh, nature of these leaders. So leadership also plays a very important role in the way uh, politics is conducted today. So it's no longer what is politically correct. It's what, it, what, what actually matters is even what is politically incorrect can be seen as a way to draw masses towards uh, a certain group, etc., cetera, to, to show support, etc. So in that regard, I would say that uh, the rise of populism uh, in, in various states uh, across the board, in fact, not only in Asia, but in Europe, and there is that distinct difference between the populist movements in Latin America and the populist movements in, um, in Europe and, um, and, and, and America, and North, Northern America, et cetera, and, and the Americas, et cetera, because, uh, the the left that it's like a left wing populism versus a right wing populism. Now, though they agree to some extent, and I do not mean that they agree completely, but to some extent, they do agree on the economic dynamics of the state and the failure of the system in terms of this inequality uh, that has been created, globalization and the after effects, etc. With especially with with trade deals like the TPP, etc. Um, and the lack of support that the TPP had in many states um, because of that. Uh, but in addition to that, so the, in addition to this economic, uh, the, the economics of, uh, the, of, of what is happening today, there is also this, because of immigration, there is a social cultural impact as well. So European states and the American uh, and, and America especially, has seen uh, a rise in right wing po right wing po populism because of the social cultural dynamic. Um, in addition to that, I would say when uh, we talk about the impact it has on democracy, it could have a dual impact because when when Abraham Lincoln said "government of the people, for the people, and by the people," that's exactly what he meant. But what is happening is that it has increased representation. But what it has actually failed at is governance. So when I mean governance, I mean accountability. I'm talking about uh, the strengthening uh, of Dr. the- Dr. Nasser, you have one more minute to wind up. Okay, the strengthening of the executive, et cetera. In addition to populism, populism, I also talk about the idea of polarization, which has in fact been widespread not only in America but also in India and other parts of the world and that has also considered to be detrimental to democracy. Uh, so I, I'll end over there so we can have questions later. Thank you sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for keeping the time uh, and for your insightful comment. We will of course have questions in the end. Uh, now our next uh, presenter is uh, Ararat Kostanian who is a research fellow at the Oriental Studies Institute of uh, National Academy of Science of Armenia. Uh, and the paper is titled, The World Between Fading Liberalism and Neo-Nationalism. Uh, over to you, Arar. Uh, I will present what interests me most. I've realized the vacuum in international relations and world policy after the fading ideology of liberalism, which is not something new that we have, and many people have realized during the COVID-19 pandemic, but I believe it becomes far 
more before than that, when started the financial uh, crisis in 2008 in the United States and it spread all over the world. But that is uh, at the same time, not uh, the crisis, but the consequence of the foreign policy that the United States started by invading countries in Middle East, especially in Iraq, and later it followed uh, in other uh, regions of the world. I don't want to politicize the issue and I don't want to talk about politics much, but I want to stress on the issue that uh, you have mentioned uh, about Fukuyama. Yes, it's true when the, at the end of the Cold War and when the United States won the, uh, the, the Cold War and uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became the leader and at the same time, the police of the world, and they imposed uh, the ideology of not only liberalism, but it became to be known as neoliberalism, which uh, Fukuyama and the others, Kissinger and Brzezinski also, they, they thought that by spreading the, uh, the liberal ideology of human rights and democratic elections in other countries, in, in other governments, and uh, the impact of the globalization will bring peace to the world and everybody will have the same lifestyle and with, uh, the same uh, image to looking to the world. But unfortunately, we have seen after this crisis and the world have seen that liberalism cannot solve problems when there is crisis because most of the time, the out of globalization, transnational and global corporations are ruling the world today more than governments are putting decisions uh, to solve the crisis. And at the same time, as uh, Chomsky mentions, what new liberalism brought is concentration of wealth and power. So uh, we have seen uh, the reputation has fallen of the United States in these two main arguments that how come that you are spreading a notion and an ideology of peace, uh, human rights, and, and coexistence, and you are bringing war and waging war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, you're supporting some uh, groups in the uh, Middle East in, in regional wars, and at the same time, of course, the financial crisis, as I have mentioned. At the same time, this problem happened to be evident before the COVID-19 in Europe when uh, you, we know the famous Yellow Velvet uh, movement started and it's unstoppable even today after the coronavirus pandemic and it's continuing on and on more than two years. So these people have realized the society have in the West itself have realized that uh, consumerism only is not the cure for human being to feel satisfied and at the same time, the rise of racism, as mentioned before, in US and in Europe started to be very problematic as we have seen during COVID-19 in US and in Europe at the same time. And that was not only some kind of uh, attacks against, against the black people, but also against the Asians due to the COVID-19 blaming the Asians of bringing or creating uh, this uh, disease, uh, the pandemic. So uh, the West needs to not only, I believe, reform, but they need to be create another ideology. As uh, Brzezinski lately in one of his articles mentioned that United States and the West need reforms, but I don't believe that out of this ideological uh, collapse, I could say, they uh, could do any reform to solve all these problems with racism, with the uh, financial problems, with the health uh, uh, scandal that we have seen. And uh, I believe that I will shift to the nationalism here, where we know that the first implication when it becomes to nationalism, we most of the time link it with fascism. Actually, that is, I believe, nowadays, it's a wrong notion, because we are seeing the rising powers and the superpowers there, they, which are rising today, 
uh, whether China, Russia, India, to regional and local levels, Syria, Egypt, for example, they all have in their ideology uh, nationally, nationalistic sentiments. For example, when uh, Xi Jinping in his books writing uh, about- Kashan, yes. uh, one more minute to wind up. Yes. Uh, when uh, Xi Jinping discusses about not only uh, socialism with, uh, he discusses the notion of socialism with Chinese characteristics, that doesn't mean only the ideas of Confucianism, but also he mentions the tradition that he brought to new China. At the same time, in Russian nationalism, we see today the ideologue Alexander Dugin, which he brought the idea of Eurasianism, uh, and it also has uh, Orthodox Christian sentiments as well. It's nationalism plus religion combined together. And also Indian nationalism is evident as well. India is coming as a super superpower. So uh, at, at the same time, uh, Yael Tamir has very interesting book uh, published in prison at 2019, Why Nationalism, Nationalism, that she discusses that Nationalism is important to bring the people together and combine the culture and national identity, language and history. So the, today out of all these problems, people need to have something that they can rely on. They can uh, feel that they belong to a community. They live their life for a reason, not only for going to shopping malls, mega malls and do some shoppings and come back at home. So life to be, uh, uh, life supposed to be and must be also uh, to belonging to your nation, but neo-nationalism, I believe, sh should be respect other people's values and other countries, because we know that uh, at the same time today we have Turkish and uh, Israeli nationalism, which is based on racism and based on invading other people's lands and countries. So neo-nationalism, I believe, should be based on mutual respect and mutual coexistence based on uh, shared culture, language, history, food, and etc. Et yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ararat, for your uh, paper, uh, your comments, and, uh, and also for keeping the time. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Begum Barak, uh, who is an independent researcher. Uh, the paper is titled An Analysis of COVID-19 Pandemic and Vaccination from a Foucauldian Perspective. Uh, Dr. Barak, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to share my screen, so let me do it. So can you see my slides? I think you can all see them. Uh, is everything okay there, dear admin? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay, yes, my uh, topic is an, is entitled An Analysis of Coronavirus Pandemic and Vaccination from a Foucauldian Perspective. Uh, shortly, I want to summarize my presentation. In my presentation, I will try to address the coronavirus pandemic and vaccination practices within the framework of French thinker Michel Foucault's uh, conceptualizations. Foucault's uh, concepts of biopower and governmentality can be used as analytical tools in the analysis of different countries' management of coronavirus pandemic. The vaccination campaign has been steadily continuing in many countries, and in this process, however, concerns and debates about the vaccines uh, have also been on the global agenda. We know that the coronavirus pandemic emerged in late uh, in 2019 in China and in a very short period of time, it spread almost all over the world. What started as a health crisis soon began to affect uh, many regions and uh, it also affected the decision-making processes of countries with the economic and security dimensions in addition to the uh, health being a health issue. Uh, First of all, I want to uh, mention a, a little a bit about uh, the coronavirus pandemic. 
uh, how it started. We, that it started in China in late 2019, and in, in the very beginning, even the big states like uh, the United States and the United Kingdom have not been very successful in uh, the crisis management of this uh, crisis of this pandemic. And also, we know that the World Health Organization and also the international institutions like European Union were not very um, successful in managing the crisis. Um, as of today, COVID-19 pandemic still remains uh, as a serious threat for many countries. We know that the, 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 uh, the, yes, the development of the vaccine against the virus can be seen as a, as a very good development. Uh, but um, again, in some regions, like I don't want to mention the countries, but yes, in some uh, regions, uh, the, the, this situation is, is still a very big threat for the for the populations. Um, so uh, the, the theoretical framework is uh, is taken from Michel Foucault's uh, concepts, as I noted. Uh, one of them is biopower. We can simply define biopower as the sort of power of exercising control over populations by the governments. The governments regulate and control populations through biopower. It is based on the application of political power on all aspects of life. And here, uh, Foucault's book uh, called uh, Discipline and Punish uh, has this concept. Uh, and uh, Foucault says that uh, we can use also this uh, concept as an uh, anatomical uh, Anatomo politics of the body focusing on the panel system. Another concept that, uh, uh, sorry, before going to the uh, moving to the other concept, uh, I also I must say that biopower can also be defined as the administration of bodies and the calculated management of life. Biopower is that the, the related to the well-being of populations. Therefore, it is it is also uh, it must also be seen as an important uh, analytical tool. tool for analyzing uh, how COVID-19 was managed by many, many states. I can say, say that vaccination can be seen as one of the um, uh, tools, strategies in this biopower, uh, as a tool of biopolitics, let's say. Another concept that I, uh, that I um, uh, formulate from Foucault uh, is, Governmentality. Governmentality can basically be defined as a sum of techniques and strategies used to make uh, a society governable. governable. Governmentality requires multiple actors in human conduct. Uh, we, in addition to state agencies like parties or the ruling elites, NGOs, scientific experts, for example, BioNTech or you know the AstraZeneca uh, experts maybe, or the media, big corporations like Microsoft maybe, or, uh, all have a role in, uh, in this governmentality process. Um, it can be argued that the COVID-19 pandemic has been a critical agent affecting state policies in terms of governmentality. Here, I want to give some examples of states' uh, approach, different states' approach to the pandemic. We know that in the early days of, uh, of the pandemic, the United Kingdom uh, officials uh, adopted the policy of uh, herd community, uh, sorry, herd immunity. Um, however, this caused the infection of uh, lots of people and this creates a problem in the UK, like a management problem of the pandemic. Uh, also the Chinese government, as you know, that uh, this government uh, keeps many things as a secret state policy and today it, uh, they question the Chinese government, maybe is it a laboratory created virus or you know any other problems about this debates. Uh, are um, dominating the discussions. For Turkey, uh, I can say some negative and positive things, but I want to talk a little bit about the positive things. Uh, Turkish government adopted a strong social welfare state approach, yes, in managing the crisis to some degree. Uh, like the VEFA social support group, they helped help the elderly people. But also, uh, yes, uh, in terms of applying the rules, I don't think that there, there, is, there, is some, uh, there, there are some equality problems in terms of applying these rules, I think, not these rules, but the social distancing or um, uh, wearing masks. Hi, Dr. The, Barak, you have uh, a lockdown. Okay. one more minute to uh, okay. okay, or the lockdown practices in some particular cafes, I think, or restaurants are not you know, equally 
equally um, applied. Yes, I want to conclude here. As noted, uh, as I noted earlier, every government has adopted a different uh, approach based on, on their style of governmental and by politics, but the purpose of each government has been the same. It is the efficient management of the crisis caused by the pandemic. Briefly, I can say that vaccination can be seen as a tool for effective governmentality uh, of the pandemic in Foucauldian terms. Here, I have some selected references if you want to uh, if you want to uh, have a look at my presentation or abstract, you can visit my Academia Edu profile and I'm going to put it in the chat box. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Barak, uh, for sharing your perspective as well as uh, for keeping the time. Uh, now we thank have you. Dr. Uh, yeah, thank you. Now we have Dr. Vikash Shukla, who's an assistant professor in Government Degree College. Uh, and the paper is titled as Democratic Deficit in South Asia. Dr. Shukla, the floor is yours. Honorable Chair, Dr. Shukla is not here. Sir. Okay, okay. Uh, then we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Jagdish Joshi uh, from University of Bergen and uh, North South University, Dhaka. And the paper is titled Challenges of Democratic Governance in South Asia, uh, a recent flux in political changes. Uh, Joshi, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor for your kind attention. So I would like to welcome all of you over here in my presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I have shown the screen over here for the reducing the risk of COVID-19 that it is increased globally. And hopefully everyone is fine over there with everyone. And hopefully we will be all right in upcoming days too. So first of all, the topic of my today's presentation is challenges of democratic governance in South Asia, a recent flux in a political changes. So politics always plays a vital role in any type of government, in any system, and in any type of the rule and regime. Because politics can create a place and politics can make a stability to, the, to enhance the governance system. So it is always to be keep in mind that politics has important role to build a nation and to break a nation. So if we talk about the flux, uh, we have seen Rohingya crisis from Myanmar. And right now we are seeing the Afghanistan crisis, which is the rebeck of uh, Taliban over there in Kabul. So we will try to focus on these two issues also predominantly. So first of all, I would go through the slide. The aim of the study. This study will try to focus on the, to understand the major challenges of democratic governance. What are the major challenges of democratic governance in a regional basis of South Asia particularly? Okay, and the, what are the challenges over the region? Actually, what the challenges the region is facing since the time? Because the South Asia has a similar culture, similar norms and tradition values, which we are sharing. And, but the South Asia has some fluxes every time within a short period of time. And if we talk about Myanmar recently, uh, we can see that the army have coup over the year and all the political leaders are over there as a arrested over the year from their home. So this is also a crisis. So these have similar impact in this region. If we talk about Europe, Europe doesn't have, uh, if the single part of Europe have a crisis, it might not have serious impact on other part. But if we talk about Asia, and especially in South Asia, it has serious impact on the other part because we are interlinked with our culture, customs, norms, and value, which I have already mentioned. So major focus of the question research over the, here in my research is that, does political change have challenged the region of democracy, regional democracy and governance? What are the major threat to democracy? These things I will focus on this study. So the, in the map, we can see that the part of the South Asia, where Nepal, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. So we can see that these countries are interlinked with each other in terms of religion, in terms of sharing boundary territory, in terms of language, culture. So in this aspect that we have somehow similarity. And also the another important part is that uh, except Nepal, Okay, almost uh, South Asia was uh, colonized by British colonial. So, 
So they had the, the system that the British colonization had left over here in South Asia also. So I further need not to describe what South Asia is, as I have already mentioned, it is also known as Indian subcontinent because the map of India, or we can say that the, some country where after the def deformation of Indian sub region, like Pakistan and Bangladesh were formed, after that also it majorly it is known as the Indian sub region or subcontinent also, because of that also the identity of South Asia is also like that. So South Asia has unique features. You know, we are multilingual. I mean, within India, they speak Hindi, they speak Nepali. In Nepal also, we are speaking Nepali. So we are sharing language also. And religion also. In Nepal, we can find a majority of Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim. And the religion is similar over there in India, Pakistan. So we are sharing norms and value, language, cultures, all these things. These are interrelated with the system of governance, system of political. And almost one important thing is that we have importance with the democratic rules and values also. Because most of the part of the almost, except Nepal, we can say that they were the colonized by Britain. So the system of governance belongs to the inheritance of European system that they have. And Nepal also has adopted the similar system. Though Nepal was an independent nation by its history, but we have impact of Indian reason. So because of that impact also, we have some issues over here. So if we talk about democracy, uh, as Kimberly have also already mentioned that, uh, as Abraham Lincoln said that it is government by the people for the people and for of the people. So, but the, now the issue is over here is that, that this uh, statement has been somehow misguided and manipulated in South Asian regions. Now it is all about the by the people. People are trying to buy it with a vote. And for the people, when we are talking about our rights and issues, we are getting far away from the people and politicians are moving far away from the public and of the people it is uh, like the muting the people's voice if we talk about Myanmar now if we talk about Afghanistan if we talk about the India uh, the recent farmer uh, movement and the CRC and RC crisis over there in India and similarly if we talk about the recent flux in Nepal uh, the fall of the one third, two third majority of the government, and uh, broken up the government backbone. And Hi, Joshi, you have uh, one more minute to wind up. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor. And the, the formation of new government, which is also the creating the problem that these issues are creating the uh, uh, major issue over the here in a democracy and governance system. Because when there is a political turmoil, the system and institution become fragile. This institution and uh, system doesn't work independently. They depend upon politics now. And the middlemen try to play a vital role over here in those system and those uh, gaps and in the vacuum. So because of that, uh, the government, the governance pillar, pillars of good governance become then fragile. And if the single or two pillars uh, become fragile, then the house will be destroyed. If there will be little second, then house will be destroyed. So in that recent flux, if uh, I have already said the Taliban flux of over the arena of Afghanistan and Myanmar, Rohingya crisis and a recent uh, politician arrested, arrested and deposed by the military and Nepal, the fall of the majority government and India similarly, the issue of uh, India over the year, the issue of the Modi government and Bangladesh, if we talk about the Bangladesh, the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Hashina, has been ruling since the, uh, it's her, I think, fourth tenure. So in uh, since her fourth tenure, the, how uh, in a democratic system, a single party can be able to rule for a long time. Democracy means the changing the system, changing the rules, and it is the alternative of the power. But when a single party rule for a long time, there can't be a democracy, uh, which we have seen for a long time in a history also. So over the main major concluding remark for the today's presentation is that the issue of democratic governance has always been a major issue for the region of South Asia because these are interlinked, interdependent with each other. 
and the political changes in the region have direct and indirect impact in the region. Democracy is not only related with the governance, but also the recent changes and fluxes in the political environment and scenario. Uh, thank you uh, for your kind attention. So I would like to end my slide over here. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joshi, for that paper. Uh, we'll, of course, discuss it in the end. Now we move on to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Isha Vimal, uh, who's a research scholar in Central University of Haryana. Uh, her paper is on assessing the role of global governance in the COVID-19 era. Over to you, Isha. Thanks, Jio. Am I audible to all of you? Yeah, you are audible. Yes, sir. So give me just one minute. I will share my screen. Hello? Yeah, Isha, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, sir, my screen doesn't share. Okay, then I think maybe you can start with the presentation. Uh, yeah. Can you... yeah. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is Isha Vimal, research scholar, scholar from Central University of Haryana. And I'm here to present my research article on topic assessing the role of global governance in the COVID-19 era. First, we talk about global governance in a brief Global governance is a movement towards political integration of transnational actors aimed at negotiating response to problems that affect more than one state or region. So here we manage all the affairs which has worldwide global presence and global governance helps in working across the multitude of issues within the global system and with the help of empirical evidences which have sufficient accounts, we can say that global institutions play a vital role in the rule-based functioning of global governance. But how it emerged, what is the origin? So we will give just one minute of its origin. In the post-industrialization world order, at the dawn of 20th century, what business witnessed the first global intergovernmental organization by name League of Nations in 1920, whose main aim was to maintain and restore world peace after the bloodshed of World War I. So, but after some time, League of Nations was not very successful and it went isolated. After that, Second World War was witnessed. And after that, we have seen that United Nations has emerged in the global arena. But this time, United Nations comes with a big responsibility, not only to maintain global peace and stability, but also includes multiple factors like social development, which gives major emphasis on health, poverty, education, and economy, and so on, social factors also included. That to meet all such needs, United Nations comes at the world stage with its various specialized agencies, and to a certain certain extent we can say that it fulfills its commitments but from the last month of 2019 the world witnessed a major global challenge in the form of covid 19 pandemic and this covid 19 pandemic knows no boundary it moves freely across the countries borders continents and in present times hardly any country left out from the deadly presence of covid 19 virus so we will see how these global institutions multi which has its multiple specialized agencies how they come forward and help to remove all the effects of COVID-19 effects. So first of all, we talk about WHO, which is a specialized agency of the United Nations, which is responsible for international public health as per their claims. So in the times of COVID crisis, we have seen that WHO itself admitted that from the from each side, there is some sort of delays to review the possible effects of airborne contagion to release important data and the announcement of COVID as pandemic from epidemic. But immediate WHO responded and initiated an independent investigation of COVID. However, WHO has been striving for mitigating global health security risks during the pandemic through containing emergency and spread of COVID-19, providing technical guidance on it, working in collaborations with scientists, businesses, and other global organizations to speed up the pandemic response and giving advice for international panel and trade in relations to, uh, to, to further stop the outbreak of this disease. And at the same time, we have seen in previous time when WHO 
come forward in the times of sadness and ebola kind of diseases where that this time was occupying our life living space so with who global presence expertise scientific researches and all did a great push to erode such diseases by linking other multilateral institutes regional organizations and other major ngos and this was in the case of health sector but if we move to finances then we talk about international monetary funds here imf understands how particular state government are trying to cope up twin problems at the same time one side the states provide affordable health care and the other side to provide sustainable livelihood to all the nationals imf itself projects this economic recession as a pan global after the great depression crisis so to deal with such intensity imf increased the lending capacity to one trillion usd to its 189 member states as well as agree to cancel payments and postpone it for uh, 25 countries for next 6 months so using its uh, one using the catastrophic containment and relief trust so this was indeed a much required step so but in the case of uh, education sector unesco comes forward united Na- this is U- united nations specialized agency by name united nations educational scientific and cultural organization one of specialized agencies of un whose one of the main aim includes helping improve education worldwide so in covid crisis unesco comes with its report that global education monitoring report 2020 and this report gave us very horrific image according to its data 40% of countries belongs to lower and lower middle income countries have not supported their learners and all at risk of exclusion in pandemic crisis and among them most of them belongs to poor linguistic minorities and disabled so uh, unesco does not stop here unesco comes up with a program by name global education coalition and according to their claim unesco said that they are working with 100 plus countries across the globe and is in this program they include their three flagship works first is connectivity making universal reality second is gender equality in terms of education third is to empower their teachers at crisis time and at the same time with the help of the same program it aims to generate 1 million youth with employability skills and aims to empower 1 million teachers with remote learning skills so although the pandemic hit harder but at the same time our global institutions work pretty hard to cope up with the situation as early and as efficiently as possible finally we talk about world bank which is an world renowned international finance institutions whose main purpose is to provide loans as well as grants to the low and middle income countries at the time of crisis so recently in the midst of covid crisis if we talk about one particular country as i'm belong to india so i'm talking about my country world bank and government of india has signed the usd 750 million agreement for an emergency responsive programs for india's msme sector that is micro small and medium enterprise uh, please wind up in a minute yes sir so we can say that all the major institutions maintain its decorum and when the country when needs it the global institutions come forward and helps us in as much possible ways and other major and one major programs comes by who unicef world bank by name gavi covax facility which provide vaccine across the globe to those countries who are not able to uh, sustain themselves so in the way forward we can say that the the world as the world is in 21st century the it has broadened its domain whole world is interconnected with each other in any part on the surface of the earth so the it sector has dominant presence across the globe use this as medium to further empower the masses and generate awareness digital world here will act as a bridge from the journey of global to local and enhance the strengthening of security safeguards when human civilization encounter such kind of global health issue it make the united nations sustainable development goals which has to met by 2030 put question mark so to meet all such goals all international health agencies work cohesively accelerate their pace of working and add divergence of international communication finally we we should put more focus on organizational reforms which mainly promote social justice maintaining peace with wider objective of sustainable development across the globe thank you so much sir that's all from my side uh thank you thank you usha for sharing your paper as well as for keeping the time uh, now we have the final speaker of the day which is uh, shankar parathi whose paper is going to be on a 
EU's Democracy Promotion Initiative in South Asia. Uh, over to you, Bharati. Uh, uh, hello, 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 sir. Can, uh, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible and your screen is also visible. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Chair and distinguished guests. And uh, I would like to ex express my get gratitude to uh, uh, Pramod Jaiswal to giving me an opportunity to present in very short notice. And I would like to present my uh, uh, like uh, paper on used uh, uh, democracy promotion initiative in South Asia. And uh, my presentation is divided in uh, five part. And I will I will I will I would try to be very specific. Uh, the uh, like presentation covers like uh, tracing the history of the uh, EU South Asia relations, and uh, and uh, its uh, background and uh, yeah, use growing importance in South Asia and what are the legal uh, documents and doctrine of the EU which, which validate uh, South Asia and democracy promotion initiatives and the role pursued by the EU. And uh, if uh, first uh, if we can see the South Asia was the never forefront policy for the EU, and uh, it, it was uh, only limited within the within the African and Caribbean Pacific countries. And and GSP uh, 1971 uh, was the first time the EU uh, looked toward the South Asia and the uh, European Summit 1972 and Lom Convention uh, 1975 was the wake-up moment for the EU. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, in, in 90, 1976, the uh, 90, 1967 Food Aid Convention uh, was took place and India and Bangladesh was the top beneficiaries of the EU. In, in 1976, uh, uh, launched the financial technical support to non-associated country, and which is a change in 1985 uh, to uh, the developing uh, developing countries for uh, Asia and Latin America. It's also called ALA regulations. In 1988, the budget separated for the Asia and Latin America, uh, uh, and uh, the use uh, the importance. Uh, like for the uh, Asia, uh, like uh, it's increased significantly after the nine by 11 terror attack in US and uh, and it's raised the serious question about the non-traditional uh, non security trade. And you, using the, uh, uh, you, using the, sorry for this inclusion using, uh, okay. Uh, the, after 90s, uh, the uh, almost all South Asian countries had adopted the open market policy like liberalization and, uh, and the, uh, and uh, South Asia is compromised the uh, like 25% uh, uh, population and which uh, which occupies the 4% land of the world and it is the fastest economy uh, economies of the world in the last uh, uh, like a few years the World Bank report says and there are new uh, two nuclear power in the region and India and Pakistan. So this, the, these are the like uh, for uh, the EU to look uh, in the region for the strengthen its partnership. And there are uh, legal uh, do, uh, documents and doctrine that uh, that like you adopted in 1994, 94, the towards uh, a, a, a new Asia strategy and in 2001. It's, they revise the same strategy with the, some change and a strategy paper and multi uh, uh, multi country program they adopted in 2005 and six and regional program for Asia strategy document uh, to, uh, 2007 to 2013 and the same they repeated the same uh, strategy paper for 2014 and 20. Uh, 20 and uh, currently the uh, the South Asia bill cover under the multi annual financial framework uh, 20, 2021 and 2027 and the democracy uh, democracy promotion initiative uh, for the South Asia uh, like first time uh, like the used values like the democracy rule of law respect of human rights it was the fundamental uh, uh, core uh, strategy for the uh, for the South Asia and and uh, in 2001, it also repeated the, uh, you can see on the screen, the same thing. And in 2005, uh, 11 action plans, uh, like integrated uh, program of action adopted by the EU and the strategy paper 2007 and 13, uh, also like uh, the repeated the protection of human rights and rights of the uh, indigenous people and uh, regional strategy paper 2014 and uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, uh, it's also covered the 
peace and security and stability and in the the, the last uh, uh, strategy paper was the one of the core uh, paper that is uh, like full fledged they recognize the diversity and uniqueness of the south asia the eu role perceived uh, uh, they they choose the like bottom up approach and promoting a demo uh, democracy and human rights uh, through uh, they uh, collaborated with the with the uh, civil society organizations and the international organization to in intervene in uh, like in uh, in nepal and nepal in 2000 uh, to, uh, to 2006 uh, th there were the like a huge role in uh, mit uh, mitigating the conflict between the uh, moist uh, revolutionaries and uh, be the the uh, monarch and uh, and this time this time like uh, the human rights violation case was the on the so peak so it was the huge concern area and the, it same uh, the eu european Uh, the european union election observation mission it's called eom that that is uh, supported uh, the electoral role making uh, with the photographs in uh, in also in bangladesh also in uh, nepal also in uh, pakistan and uh, uh, afghanistan current uh, in the past and uh, post conflict nepal they supported uh -huh, mr bharti you have one more minute to wind up Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. I I would like to just uh, end up. So so you can see the European ro role, European observation mission uh, initiative undertaken in the the different year on the on the screen: Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, and Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan. And cur uh, currently, uh, in situation of Af Afghanistan is not good. So you is the if if we are creating uh, also their humanitarian staffs. and uh, and the people who involved in the uh, development process in afghanistan thank you so much for uh, your kind at attention thank you ha, if you have you, any Bar question please ask me yeah uh, uh, thank you barbi for the presentation as well as uh, for keeping the time uh, so now we are officially out of time uh, but uh, we can extend the session a bit because we started a bit late uh, so we have time for some questions to be asked uh if there are any questions from the audience uh, uh if they had posted it in the chat box uh i don't see anything here uh so yeah as we wait for that uh let me just briefly uh, uh sort of uh, uh comment on each of the papers and maybe uh, we'll have one round of response from the uh, presenters uh with respect to dr nasrit uh, paper it was a very thought provoking paper uh since i want to keep my comments brief i don't want to go into the positive points of any of the papers i just want to give some uh questions or comments uh so what about the notion that uh, democracy itself is prone to populism you had kind of brought out the link between populism and uh, uh how it's impact democracy but there is also this critique of democracy itself going back to uh ancient greek philosophy itself uh, that uh democracy itself can lend itself to the rise of populism uh so how do we uh understand that in the context of rising populism across the world so i think that is something that kind of crossed my mind when i was listening to your paper uh i'll just give the comments for everybody and then of course you can respond in any order you want uh with respect to uh mr arar kostanian's paper about neo nationalism uh uh is it really neo nationalism in the sense that is the nationalism which is emerging in india china is it any different from the 18th century nationalism of course There are differences in context. It's post-colonial countries and all that. Uh, but if you think about the worst effects of nationalism, which ultimately led to First World War and Second World War, you see China's actions in Hong Kong or China's posture towards Taiwan, or the recent Indo-China disputes or India-Pakistan disputes. Uh, uh, is is this nationalism something to be more uh, hopeful about? Can it kind of provide uh, a, a more stable basis for uh, the global order? Is something. Uh, i'm a little uh, uh, skeptical about uh, maybe you can share your views on that uh now uh, dr barak's paper which gave a very interesting foucauldian perspective uh, on the positive role of governmentality uh, in mass vaccination uh, uh i'm just wondering uh, uh, the post modern foucauldian sensibility uh how much of that contributed to vaccine resistance as well right of course governmentality enables people to uh it enables you to have a mass vaccination drive which is well and good uh but there is an also an element of uh, foucauldian resistance to power in vaccine resistance as well uh so yeah i would just like to hear your thoughts on that uh, uh so thank you so do you want me to say a few words about this 
uh, uh, yeah, we'll we'll come back to you in the sense that I'm just giving my comments on all the papers. Then of course, all six oh, of you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, it'll be easier that way, I guess. Uh, so uh, then we have, then we come to uh, Joshi's paper on uh, uh, democracy and governance in South Asia. Uh, I would just like to hear your thoughts on how do you situate it in the context of uh, uh, similar democratic issues faced across the world. Like you talked about uh, uh, by the democracy being bought with money, uh, uh, but that's not only in South Asia, right? In the US elections are some of the most expensive in the world uh, and it's increasingly true of elections across the world. So we do see uh, similar trends, which are of course there in South Asia as well, uh, present across democracies throughout the world. Uh, so how do you see that? Like, how do you see this kind of almost universal uh, issues associated with democracy cutting across regions? Uh, I'd like to uh, hear your thoughts on that. Uh, now, coming to Isha uh, Vimal's paper on global governance, uh, uh, how do you respond to those who probably do not share your optimism about global governance in the sense that if you look at the response of uh, WHO, or the COVAX program uh, in, uh, uh, in its success or failure in sending vaccines to poor countries. Uh, uh, and ultimately now you have rich countries talking about booster shots, whereas there are a lot of poor countries across the world who do not even uh, have enough vaccines for a single shot to their population, even for the vulnerable ones. Uh, is, is, is it a cause for celebration? Like as go as, hasn't global governance failed uh, in, in tackling this pandemic? Uh, how would you respond to someone who has uh, uh, a less optimistic view of global governance? Uh, now, yeah, to, to finally, uh, uh, Bharti's paper on EU's role, I have just two related uh, questions. One is, uh, uh, how do you see EU's credibility on democracy promotion being affected uh, by the kind of uh, uh, democratic or liberal failings which are happening in Hungary or Poland and rise of uh, uh, nationalism uh, and democratic kind of authoritarianism within Europe. Uh, so how does that affect EU's credibility in promoting uh, democracy in other regions like South Asia? And a related question is that uh, how impactful uh, EU uh, has been in South Asia? Do you think EU has had an impact in promoting democracy, whether EU has any relevance uh, in South Asian politics? So these will be broadly my comments and uh, kind of uh, uh, thoughts on each of the papers. Now uh, you can kind of respond to the questions or comments if you want, uh, one by one. It's open to all of you again. May I? Oh, please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, but uh, Miss, Miss Burak, uh, she was started, uh, so, so she may start first. Uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Burak can start. Uh, Dr. Burak, if you want to go ahead first, you can go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as I noted in my presentation, uh, the, the concepts that I have uh, addressed, uh, I think are quite useful in, uh, in, an, in the analysis of uh, the management of coronavirus pandemic uh, from a Foucauldian perspective, as I said, but yes, uh, Another concept that can be seen uh, as some kind of, you know, uh, can also be seen um, as an analytical tool in uh, analyzing the reactions against the pandemic. Uh, this is, uh, I think, this is uh, this can be analyzed from the uh, from uh, Foucault's understanding of power because, according to Foucault, power is not uh, is is not central and it's it is you know it is. Uh, uh, circulated among many uh, folk, uh, points. So we can say that in nowadays, uh, thanks to social media and other uh, other platforms, many people can reach um, uh, uh, a huge amount of information about the pandemic and also about the vaccines, uh, the pros and cons of the vaccines. So uh, some people uh, resist uh, uh, the uh, vaccination policies of the states 
In this regard, I can say, say that another concept of Foucault can also be uh, useful. So Foucauldian understanding of power is also important because in, in previously, we know that uh, power was like a central uh, authority and only the elites maybe can have the access to power. And they, they used to control the masses, control the knowledge and information. But today, power, power is not centralized, so people can easily uh, access knowledge and Everyone is, you know, uh, as powerful as, you know, as the other, uh, as each other. I can say so. Uh, in another, in, on the other side of the coin, I can say that uh, uh, states use vaccination as a tool to uh, fight the, against the pandemic, but also the citizens and the masses use um, the uh, social media and other sources as a uh, as a source of power and as a source of knowledge to uh, make their own decisions in this uh, in this journey i think could i answer your question uh, i'm sorry yeah yeah thank you Barak. yeah uh, uh, thank you thank you uh, yeah uh, anybody else can uh, uh, start now? yeah uh, we all have to uh, wind up soon so uh, please keep your comments brief of course we can continue our discussion through email or through other means after the session may i join you, yeah, yeah, because, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, of course, the question you raised it it has it has a meaning, at, and uh, it has somehow to be people cautious when they hear the word nationalism, as I as I mentioned in my presentation. And why I put the term neo-nationalism? Actually, this is my term. I invented the the two words I combined together: neo-nationalism to put the stress on the, that it differs from the nationalism created in Europe in uh, 17th and 18th century, which that was uh, more stressed on creating a, a foreign policy to wage war between the newly established nations in Europe. So the nationalism when established in Europe was mainly to wage wars against each other but when we see when look, when we look at it today to this neo-nationalist issue which is coming and it's very interesting the stress is put on inward so the stress is put on more on the inner lifestyle of the countries which today are uh, on the front of showing this new uh, version of nationalism as i have mentioned russia and china and india is coming so these countries, although there are conflict that coming from past, which is not in this, I mean, last 30 years or 40 years, uh, the Kashmir or the Hong Kong, as you have mentioned, but uh, the new nationalism that have I mentioned is more regarded to how to create new society and how to create new identity to the people that they are today in a crisis, social crisis not only financial crisis and people today societies today they need to feel that they belong to any community their life is based on uh, an idea that they should live and they could bring their culture forgotten culture because of this uh, uh, how to say liberal conservatism uh, and consumerism some people that they had uh, cultures for for a thousand years today, non the new generation, they, they have zero knowledge about their ancestors. So I believe that the neo-nationalism that I'm talking about shouldn't be outward, but it shouldn't be inward. And at the same time, I have mentioned that all the countries that they will rely on nationalism, it shouldn't be white exceptionalism as it's happening during Trump era in the United States. It should be based on mutual respect and mutual coexistence. So that's how we can bring that uh, war conflict, a uh, war issue that you are concerned about between nations to a uh, minimum. You know, after after the after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as I have mentioned, the West, uh, especially the United States, the ideologues like uh, Fukuyama and the rest I mentioned, I don't want to repeat the names, but they were kind of so uh, have some positive notion that the world will become one, they will be big global family and the rest. But we have seen that wars after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
didn't decrease but increased. And first of all, the liberal family and precisely the United States started to wage wars against Afghanistan, Iraq, Middle East, other countries. So bringing nationalism to front, it doesn't mean that wars will increase. As I have mentioned, you know, in international yeah, uh, relations- uh, Thank you, uh, thank you, Barak, we are out of time. Uh, thank yes, you, uh, just uh, last so, word, I am yeah. relying on both uh, realism and idealism. What I'm saying is combination of realism and idealism. There is something also idealism in my words because this is not 100% hmm. formed uh, ideology yet. It's hmm. new and it will it will it will uh, develop by time. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We can continue this discussion. Thank you. In some other form, yeah. Uh, it's a very thought-provoking paper. Uh, anybody else wants to uh, respond? Yeah. yeah. I would like to respond to your. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Nasrudin. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so yes, I do agree with you um, that democracy does in some way and form give rise to populism and vice versa. But the, what I'm trying to say is that this whole idea of majoritarianism and the rise of, of uh, polarization in politics, etc., that is what I'm saying is detrimental to democracy or rather that is the adverse effects on democracy where in, in a democratic government, when you have excessive power in the hands of the executive and you sideline the legislative and the judicial branches, or rather all these branches of government are in the hands of a particular party. I mean, it's partisan polarization all around. It is then where, where it is then that there is a problem for democracy because as it is, represent uh, democracy, uh, populism gives rise to, rep that does increase representation. But what happens is that when you sideline certain establishments, now you can re revamp establishments, political re uh, establishments can be revamped. But if you, if you were to say that uh, you, you, you disregard political establishments all by themselves, and you don't you work outside the purview of these establishments, that is where the problem I think occurs. So that's my comment. I hope that-, that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Nasser. Actually, populism is a very interesting and very relevant topic and more work needs to be done and your paper is certainly a uh, contribution to that. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Joshi, Isha, uh, Bharat, anybody wants to respond or- yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, I would, I would like to express. Uh, the, thank you, yeah. Chair. Yeah. Uh, yes, your question is very, very important, and it's very interesting. The like you is the uh, like uh, their the decision making based on the consensus. Consensus. So the like you is not in that uh, capable power to like directly affect the. It is the economic uh, institution more uh, rather than a political one. So you can't uh, like uh, impose any like uh, strict uh, restriction to the Hungary and Poland. It's not only populism rise in the Hungary and Poland. It's also in uh, it. It has seen in the Eastern Germany and its rise up. And in the recent uh, the Chancellor election, uh, there will be. Uh, th uh, this e effect also can seen uh, see there, and uh, and your uh, second question like how the credibility of uh, like affected the world river order and the uh, and the uh, the uh, like uh, implication in the South Asia like uh, you is the more like civilian power and uh, civilian and humanitarian power in South Asia their engagement is more about development policy they uh, uh, the, like you and south asia are like a uh, top uh, trading partner so uh, the eu priority is focus on on the those uh, like uh, in the budget contribution in the like uh, ldc countries in south asia uh, and with the with the budget support and uh, in education funding and these are the uh, more core area where you uh, support so that you uh, wants to like uh, go for the strategic partnership uh, other than like uh, Bangladesh is capable and they have potential uh, and uh, Pakistan. So they are looking for more uh, free trade agreement in this region because due to their nature of the European Union is itself a uh, trade and uh, economic organization. Thank you so much. I hope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bharati. Uh, now, Joshi and uh, Isha, you guys want to comment on your, uh, give your final response? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, it was a serious note from you that uh, how we can look after the 
democratic issue all over the globe. I mean, all around the world, the political issue regarding the democracy are similar, but how we, we can look at particularly in terms of South Asia. The main focus over here in South Asia is that we have two big power in South Asia. One is India itself, that is the part of South Asia and which is playing as a predominant role to try to control South Asia itself. Uh, but there we have, we can see side role of China also, which is trying to promulgate its policy in the South Asia by its Belt and Road Initiative and other things. So if we talk about the democracy, their influence and their power has played important role in, term, in while making our democratic norms and values established and uh, for settling them in a matured form. And in terms of other global context, if we say the democracy, there might not be the serious impact of one country upon the other. There might be the issue of refugee and other thing, but the one country of political interest might not have impact on other country. If we talk about Nepal and India, let's I would just give an example. In 2015, Nepal promulgated its constitution, but there was a serious re restriction from the Indian side which we got our border blocked. So it means that the dependence and independence of a country also is trying to be influenced from one power to another power. So these are the things that uh, democracy is challenged within the South Asian region. And the conflict between the nation has also had some impact over here in democracy. If I have tried to give answer of your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think uh, the the power play between China and India is going to greatly influence uh, how uh, all of the countries in the region are going to uh, uh, kind of uh, going forward, uh, their political systems and all that. Uh, thank you, uh, Joshi, for doing that. Uh, now, Isha, do you want to respond? Uh, are you there? Uh, she, she left? Okay, so maybe I think she left. Uh, so, I think yeah, we've come to the conclusion of our session then. Uh, uh, thank you for all the six participants for presenting wonderful papers and also for bearing with me and my questions in the end uh, and for responding to that. Uh, I think it was a very interesting session, very relevant, very uh, important to the times we live in. Uh, I think these papers make an important contribution to your respective fields or respective areas. Uh, uh, I, I hope you guys work on it and publish it in future. Uh, I, I will also uh, have to extend my thanks to NICE for organizing this uh, uh, event. Uh, uh, and for the past one and a half years, I've been seeing NICE organizing so many events uh, to the credit of Dr. Uh, Pramod Jaiswal. Uh, so I'm happy to be uh, part of one of it. Uh, and so thank you for inviting me to be the chair. Uh, so with that, we conclude this session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good night if it's night in wherever you are, or have a good day if it's just starting. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, as we come to the end of NICE International Studies Convention 2021, it is with great pride and honor that I propose a word of thanks on behalf of NIICE Nepal to everyone who has graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. First of all, we would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to the distinguished chairs and speakers and those who joined us in the final session of the convention. Uh, did anyone say something? Uh, we're really honored to have all the speakers with us this evening. The three-day convention with the theme Reimagining the World, Reflections of the Future of the World Order was in inaugurated by Ambassador Ahmed Salim. Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Maldives, and former Secretary General of SARC, Professor Dr. Chintamani Mahapatra, Rector, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Professor Theo Farrell, Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Wollongong, Professor Sanjay Kumar Pandey, Professor Sanjay Kumar Pandey, Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Dr. Amit Gupta, Associate Professor, Department of International Security Studies, USAF Air War College.
Professor Dr. Zong Zeming, Head of Department of International Relations and Associate Dean of School of Political Science and International Studies, Tongji University. We were extremely humbled and encouraged by their presence. During the 45 sessions throughout the convention, we were joined by a stellar lineup of eminent speakers, including Akar Patel, sir, Executive Director, Am Amnesty International India, Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta, political scientist and former Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University, and many others. I also must mention our deep sense of appreciation towards excellencies who grace the event with their presence. We acknowledge with gratitude the support and encouragement provided by our partners, and therefore we would like to take this opportunity to place on record our sincere thanks to all our 24 partners, Center for Peace and Development, India, Center for the Study of Nepal, Banaras Hindu University, Council on Pacific Affairs, Department of Gandhian and Peace Studies, Mahatma Gandhi Central University, India, Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, India, Department of International Relations and Governance Studies, School of Humanities and Social Studies, Shivnadar University, India, Department of International Relations, Jahangir Nagar University, Bangladesh, Department of International Relations, South Asian University, India, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, Department of Politics and International Relations, Central University of Jharkhand, India, Department of Strategic Studies, Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, General Sir John Kotlewala Defense University, Faculty of Law University, St. Clement Odyssey, North Macedonia, Faculty of Political Science and International Studies, University of Warsaw, Institute for Research and European Studies, North Macedonia, Institute of the Middle and Far East, Yangolian University, Poland, Pekriadi Creative Diplomacy, Russia, Pondicherry University, India, Pontifical Catholic University of Argentina, Prajna Initiative, USA, Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University, Japan, Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration, Russia, Simon Fraser University, Canada, SOAS University of London, United Kingdom, University of Kerala, India. Likewise, we would also like to recognize our gratitude towards our media partners, Khabarhub.com, Radio Candid 92.7 MFZ, and all the other national and international media outlets for covering NICE International Studies Convention 2021. An event like this cannot happen overnight, and we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated people here at NICE. Without their indispensable and untiring efforts, this event wouldn't have been possible. It is through great joy and pleasure that I extend my gratitude to our event committee. A huge shout out to our social media team, Akhilesh, Gaurav, Deepak, Nanda, Malvika, Vivaksha, Arya Nishant, Teek Raj, and all the others who contributed in the social media department. Thanks to Tan, to Sheila for working on the reports for all of these days. Thanks a lot, you've been a great help. Everyone involved in the video making process, Sagar, we do acknowledge your hard work and we greatly appreciate you. A big, big, big thanks to Somnima and Sanana for being the pillars of the event. Now, as they say that uh, there's always a man of the match. So thank you, Nimesh, for everything you did for this event, the videos, managing the sessions and everything all in all. Thanks for helping in the coordination so efficiently. Thank you guys for being the backbone of the convention. Thanks a lot and you're all amazing. Our sincere thanks also goes to our director, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, sir, for his valuable input in organizing the conclave with a stellar lineup of panelists. I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take on completion of tasks beyond their comfort zones. But finally, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our Zoom audience from all around the world and those who are watching this live on Facebook. Thank you for your valuable time and attention. We hope you keep supporting us in the future as well. 
The recorded version of the conclave will be uploaded on our YouTube handle, NIICE Nepal. Please do watch them as you might have missed several insightful sessions due to the time zone, or maybe uh, they might be conducted in the parallel zone. We're truly honored to have you all with us throughout the convention, and we hope to stay connected with you in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good night. Stay safe.